Good morning, church. Um, I might, I don't know if I, I don't know if I want to sit down. Um, earlier this week, um, I had the privilege of lounging in the backyard with my two younger sons, Salem and Redding, and um, I'm off to the side just sitting down, and my five-year-old Redding says to me, um, "Dad, how do I use this? It's it's not cutting. Can you?" Go to the first picture. And um, so I walk up to him and I say, yeah, son, that's a shovel. So it's probably going to take you almost forever to try to cut through that piece of wood. So I think he's just playing around with the instrument, so I don't make anything of it. And then um, I go around and I'm watching Salem again, and he calls out to me again and he says, Dad, this, this isn't working either. And so he shows me uh, another picture. And I say, Redding, those are, um, at this point in time, it obviously, he has an agenda, so I have to step in and get a little bit more serious. But I say, son, those are uh, mini head shears. They're, they're not built for that either. Um, so that'll probably take you about forever as well. So um, what, I, what I do is I say, um, I go and I explain to him, I say, well, son, these are, these are just for cutting sticks, like branches and, and little twigs or whatnot. And he goes on, and he, and he continues to cut the little branches and twigs and whatnot. Um, but at that moment, I started to think how this is likely analogous to the way human beings have treated the Bible probably for the past 22 to 2,500 years. So um, if you have your Bibles, you can open them to Luke chapter 24, verse 45, and... You know, I think I am going to sit down holding this mic. And while you're finding that, I just want to provide a little bit of context. At this moment, Jesus has already re resurrected. Um, but his disciples don't recognize him because they were so bewildered and baffled um, and couldn't understand and make sense of the fact that he had died, even though he, they had spent three intimate years with him. And so... He goes on when he's talking to them, and he starts explaining to them. He says, uh, Jesus had to open their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the, the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. Now, I don't know how many in here have spent a lot of time in the Old Testament, but I never found that either. And I am a Christian on this side reading Luke, and he's telling me that this is what it's about. And so for me, myself, I'm thinking, well, this isn't the, this isn't the clearest thing, Jesus. Come on, man. Give us a hand here. Um, but for whatever reason, the Jews had their issues, but it started to make me think, well, if I'm on this side and I still don't see it, then maybe there are some unique barriers that us as modern American Christians might have as well, so that we can't go to the Hebrew scriptures and see Jesus all through them. Not little popcorn prophecies. I know we're familiar with those, but the fact that he's laced throughout the entire scriptures. I spent like 10 years trying to understand this stuff. I, I, I actually got to the point where I gave up until I came across, I don't know if you ever heard of them, um, there's some brothers in Oregon uh, who have an organization called the Bible Project. And um, there are many great Hebrew scholars out there. And I'm not saying he's the best, but their ministry of helping you to see how this is a unified story that points to Jesus is unmatched. And if you care at all to understand the Hebrew scriptures, and I really hope you do, I strongly commend these brothers to you. And so Tim Mackey, the scholar over there at Bible Project, he offers three reasons, and I added my own, a fourth, of why we might often fail to see Jesus laced throughout the scriptures. So the first one he says is that we often view the Hebrew scriptures as a moral handbook. In other words, we go to the Old Testament and we see it and we try to find a list of rules of, of how to behave. And so he's saying, um, 
Not that you can't derive morality from the Hebrew Bible. That's not what it's de de designed to do. Um, he goes on and he says, um, a lot of people also treat it like a devotional grab bag. And um, I, like, I like what he said when I was listening to him. He said, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with devotionals. And I was like, you know, there is nothing wrong with devotionals. You should devote yourself to reading scripture. Um, so I, I tried to think of my own way of putting it. And what I said was uh, motivational cherry picking is what I said. And this is dangerous because this is when you go through and you find the, the feel-good passages that kind of help you go throughout the day. But there's, a never, uh, there's, a, there's another very important portrait that's being given to you that is equally important to pay attention to, and it doesn't always feel good. So if all you go into it is just cherry-picking for motivation, there's a lot that you're going to miss out on. Um, and then also, um, and I'm really guilty of this one, because uh, I like to debate and argue, but I would go to it as a theology dictionary. And it, this is really awkward, that we would go to it and we would try to like categorize God's character into these like professional terms, you know, like Arminianism versus Calvinism and all of these things. Um, and again, maybe, maybe there is some uh, theology that can be derived from the book, but again, that's not what it's designed to do. Um, and the fourth one that I kind of added a, on my own that I think has led to quite a bit of divi uh, divisiveness, um, not only between the church and outsiders, but also within the church, and that's seeing it as this science or history uh, textbook where we go to the scriptures and we use it strictly for like fact checking to, to go and argue with somebody about the reliability of the scriptures. Well, I would commend to you that the scriptures are reliable but they are not a science nor a history textbook. And that's a, that's a big hurdle to try to get over. So um, I'm naming these before you, not as judgment so that you feel bad or anything about how you read the scriptures, but because I have personally witnessed these elements distract me from seeing how the entire scriptures point to Jesus. So as followers, we want to read it according to his design as a story that points to Jesus. And so today, what I hope to present to you is that the Bible is this rich selection of literature um, that's been designed to generate a proper anticipation for the coming messianic figure. Now notice I say the anticipation, not understanding. Something to really think about is um, the Bible had an evolution while God was working with his people, Moses didn't have the prophets, right? David didn't have, well, he had a few prophets, but he didn't have the ones that came later. So it was an evolving document. And they're writing these documents in anticipation of the coming messianic figure. And so throughout it, as a quick summary, and these are the points that we're going to go through today, he's portrayed as a human intercessor with divine status that will sacrifice himself on our behalf and preach the forgiveness of sins. And that faith alone will reinstate Yahweh's eternal reign over us. Now again, if you're like me, I never saw that stuff in the Hebrew Bible. Um, but it is there loud and proud if you're able to erase your own cultural lens that you're bringing to it and try to look at it as they wrote the scriptures. So we are only scratching the surface today but I hope it's enough to inspire you to go to these Hebrew scriptures and really get a deeper understanding of your Lord and Savior, which I am personally convinced will augment your faith. So we're just going to dive right in, okay? Um, as a quick disclaimer, I was, it was a struggle to think about these things because, man, again, uh, Tim Mackey has done a wonderful job, and I've been spending the last four years not only following him, but, but reading his references, um, and I just, I'm just like, four years later, I still don't feel qualified to teach on something like this. Um, so I'm just going to try to speak plainly to you about the things that I've learned. This is more of a testimony than a, than, than a teaching. So um, jumping right, oh, and let me just say, I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a, uh, throw some Bible verses out there. Um, don't follow around because I'm going to just be all over the scriptures. But I'll mention them. Feel free to write them down or I can provide them to you later. 
but I'll, I'll just be all around. So just feel free to just listen or take notes or, or whatever it is that you're thinking about. So right off the bat in Genesis 3.15, the context is that God created humans and we forfeited our opportunity to go into this robust uh, relationship with him and be his partners that oversee and run the, the planet. And so one of the, when he is um, admonishing his creatures, as any good parent does, uh, he goes and he says to the woman, specifically at this time, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. So in her seed, this is a human. And what's stated about this human, if you go after that, it is it says, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the hill. And so from the jump, these ancient figures are looking for some human figure to come and rescue them from whatever is going on in the world. This, it's always been expected to be a human figure. Um, so um, anyway, gosh, I can go on so many rabbit trails. Um, so what you see then after that is, is a bunch of stories of what is often like they're, they're so-called Bible heroes that we've called them to. But um, in actuality, they're actually, they're disappointments, actually. That's, that's actually how we're supposed to be reading the story of Noah, the story of Abraham, the story of Moses, the story of David. They're actually disappointments. They're, they're not Bible heroes. You might not want to take your kids to these stories and encourage them to be like these guys. Um, and pretty glorious disappointments, but disappointments nonetheless. But what they do, what, what, what they're highlighting for us is elements of this upcoming messianic figure. And that's what we're supposed to be deriving from it. So, for example, and some of this stuff is odd, and you just got to put a different cultural lens on. So Noah is introduced in a genealogy. I think this is in Genesis 5, at the end of Genesis 5. And this genealogy is important, because remember, it's going to come through her seed. So we're waiting for somebody to come. And so he's introduced uh, in this genealogy. He's a blameless man that intercedes and sacrifices and it leads God to change his course of action in terms of his wrath. That sound familiar? Okay. So, um, but Noah does. I'm going to take a sip of this because I feel like I'm about to spill it. Um, but he goes on and he disappoints us. And so then after that, uh, a guy by the name of Abraham is, cho is picked out. And he's also introduced in the genealogy. Again, this is tracking back with the fact that this is her seed. Um, and he's introduced kind of as the new Noah. And there's a lot of like ancient Hebrew stuff going on for you to be able to pick that up. Um, but uh, right off the bat, through the imagery of offering sacrifices on a high mountain and calling on the name of Yahweh. This is in Genesis 4. Now, um, what you need to know is that Eden is depicted as a place on a high mountain, which had some significant uh, meaning, you know, back in those days. So, so the fact that he's on a mountain offering sacrifices is not to be overlooked if you're, you're an ancient Jew and you're reading this context. So we're looking at Abraham as the one. Um, but we often know that Abraham has his set of disappointments too. We move on to Moses. Now Moses is a heavy hitter. He comes through, he goes through the chaotic waters, which in scripture, ancient scripture, you know, um, ancient, uh, keep, yeah, imagery. I keep wanting to say mythology, not mythology. Um, but in some mythology uh, stories, it's seen, as, the waters are seen as like a symbol of death. So Moses goes through death to deliver his people and intercede for them through self-sacrifice. He stands on the top of the mountain and he says, Lord, I know they made this golden calf, but, but take me. So through self-sacrifice and advocacy, he's saying, don't do it because of he's, he's advocating for us. And it moves Yahweh to retain his wrath and he, he doesn't destroy the people of Israel. Again, does this sound familiar? So, so these, are roles, these are roles that these guys are, are playing out. Uh, 
one final figure, because he's, he's another heavy hitter, is, is David, who's depicted as a royal prophet that crushes the head of a giant snake. Now, do you remember back at Genesis 3.15 what the common Savior is, is supposed to be doing? Now, if you read David and you're like me, how I was, so again, no judgment, you're not crushing the head of a giant snake? What is that about? So interestingly, if you can recall the story, he said to put on bronze. Like uh, he has like this bronze armor or whatnot. Now that, that word bronze in Hebrew is very similar to the word snake. So it's actually a word play going on. So Goliath is depicted as this snake figure symbolic of sin. And how does David defeat him? With a slingshot and a rock to the what? To the head. Okay? So David is depicted as this messianic figure coming to lead his people. And then we all know the story of David and Bathsheba. So again, we got another glorious disappointment. Um, and also, just a side note, giants is another biblical reference back to these forces of evil that tend to impose themselves on us and cause us to do things outside of the will of God. So giant, snake, all of these things are pointing all the way back to the beginning of Scripture. And so again, you know, we, I, I have admittedly read these guys as uh, as sort of biblical heroes that maybe I need to follow. But actually what we're supposed to be doing is digging through this and getting a better portrait of the one who is to come. Amen. So um, all of these things happen, guys. And if you, if you know the full history of, of, of Israel, they go into exile because they just aren't pleasing the Lord, to say, to say the least. And... While in Israel, there, you know, God has always been faithful to, to retain a remnant. And so this remnant is doing a lot of reflection and reading these stories, and, and they, they're thinking these things. Now, you know what? We're going to need a greater than Moses or a greater than David. They start to think of these things. And lo and behold, later on down the line, to many of, of the prophets that God sets up, he gives them affirmation, much like what he did in the book of Revelations. But this is like Revelations, you know, in 700 B.C. So if you look at Daniel 7.13, Daniel sees an image. He says, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came to the ancient days and was presented before him. Presented before him. Why is he presented before him? Well, how's he going to intercede for us? So he was presented to the Father. Now, this clouds of heaven statement is not just fluffy poetry. You have to know that throughout the Old Testament, Yahweh alone is depicted as the cloud rider. This is like a thing in ancient literature. So, for example, in Deuteronomy 33, 26, um, he rides the heavens through the skies. Psalm 68, 32 says he rides upon the highest heavens. And in Psalms 104, he, the clouds are his chariot. Isaiah 19, 1, it says Yahweh is riding on a swift cloud. I'm sorry, I just had to make sure we, we're good. Um, he's, he's riding on a swift cloud. So the fact uh, we know by this time that only Yahweh is the cloud rider. Um, but it's one like a son of man. Now, this is peculiar because the son of man in the ancient Hebrew scriptures is a man. That's, that's what it is. The son of man is a man where the son of God has a different connotation than what we might read in the New Testament. The son of God in the ancient scriptures often referred to spiritual beings. So when someone was depicted as a son of man, they're depicted as a human. And so right here in Daniel 7, Daniel is getting this vision that Yahweh is going to come as a man in order to intercede on my behalf. This is right here. We don't even have to go to Paul yet. We haven't touched the New Testament, y'all. So um, these are not hero stories. Um, these are portraits of the role and character of God's chosen one. That's what these, that's what these stories are all about. Um, I love this one. Um, it says that the coming chosen one will sacrifice himself on our behalf. Now, I want to talk to you about two rituals in the Old Testament scriptures. 
Um, the first one is Passover that I think many of you might be uh, familiar with, but I'll, I'll talk about it just a little bit. The context is that the, the Israelites are in, um, in Egypt. They're enslaved. Yahweh saves them. Oh, side note, I got to say the side note. The book of Exodus in Hebrew is called the name. So what it's about is um, Yahweh is fully revealing his identity to his people. That's what the book of Exodus is all about. I just, I don't know if that's related, but that is so profound. It makes me think about the book of Exodus completely different now. Um, but what he does is he delivers his people. He's identifying himself as the, as the savior of Israel. And what he does is he commands them to put the blood of a lamb, you know, at the top and the side of, of the doorpost. And what's going on is that the life of an unblemished lamb through its death, it's not the death of the lamb, but it's actually the life of the lamb that's protecting the Israelites from judgment, namely a plague of death. So we've all sung the song covered by the blood of Jesus, right? So we're here. We're, we're right here. Um, and this is my absolute favorite one, because if any of you know anything about the book of Leviticus, it's not really the book you go to and read for fun. But I started doing it now because something has been revealed to me, y'all. So what you need to know first is that um, I say it's not a science or history book. The, the Bible is probably best depicted, as Tim Mackey says, as literary art. In other words, it's poetic in form, even the narratives mostly. And so they use a lot of literary devices to get things across. So for, and, and if you don't know what a literary device is, that's like a paragraph. A paragraph is a literary device. People didn't always just write in paragraphs. So it's a literary device, indentation, punctuation marks. Um, a lot of times we didn't have punctuation marks. These are literary devices to help us read things. Well, one literary device that was, that is just, it perv you, you have to kind of know this literary device to really appreciate and see whether scripture is emphasizing things. But it's called, um, it's called symmetry. And what they do is, you ever read the whole, uh, Hebrew scriptures and seen how, they, you might read a story, and then you'll read the exact match of that story again, and you're like, why are they doing that? He, he just said that. I, I, never, I never got the point of it. But the purpose of it is, is to match a symmetry. Well, guys, um, and in the middle of the, the two identical or matched parts would be the place of emphasis. So believe it or not, the entire Torah from Genesis to Deuteronomy is a symmetry. The entire Torah. In other words, Genesis and Deuteronomy are linked together in certain type of ways. Exodus and Numbers are linked together in certain type of ways. And then right in the middle is the book of Leviticus, the very book we always skip. That's problematic. So, um, so what it is is, so Leviticus itself has a three-part structure. And in the middle of that three-part structure is the Day of Atonement. So if you should, next, in your next devotion, read the Day of Atonement laws. You should probably do that. Now, what you need to know about the Day of Atonement, if I could, if I could explain it um, quickly, is that you have two goats, okay? And so with one goat, it's the life that is the blood of the goat that cleanses the tabernacle from Israel's uncleanliness and conventional feelings. It's this imagery of that the earth has to be purified from what we've done to it. Because if you can remember, going back to Cain and Abel and many other people, it's the blood that's crying out to God. All right, so creation has to be cleansed. Now, I really want y'all to, we, we often talk about the, what Jesus' death did for us. But what, the, what these scriptures are often pointing to, these laws are often pointing to, is that it's the life that, that, that cleanses us. Uh, and they make this very clear. Leviticus 17, 11 says, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you. I have given it to you. You didn't provide the lamb. I did on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood by reason of the life that makes atonement. Okay? So, um, 
uh, Leviticus 17, 11. So for the second goat, he doesn't die. But what happens is, is that they, they press, the, they symbolically press the sins of Israel onto this goat and it's exiled from the camp. Okay, so these major rituals point to the call of God's chosen one. That's, that's what they're doing. Number one, through death, because how else can I reach the life? The, the, the death is just unfortunately an essential prerequisite for the life to come about and cleanse us. But through death, his blameless life, that's another thing I forgot to mention, the goats have to be unblemished. Uh, his blameless life will eradicate sin and it's staying and protect us from God's judgment. Right here. You don't have to read Paul to get that. Um, and number two, that he's going to bore our sin so that we become separated from sin so that we can live in full righteousness. I don't know if you ever read 1 Peter 2. That's exactly what he's talking about. So um, one thing that I, Isaiah is tracking with all of these things, he's and, and all of all. Of, you know, Israel's prophets. But Isaiah has tracked with this the best. And that's why it's become quite a, a famous passage. I'm going to read a portion of it. But guys, when you go home, read all of Isaiah 53. Read the whole thing. But I'm just going to read a part of it. It says, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. I'm reading from the NLT. I like that translation. It's plain, but it's often pretty faithful. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down, and we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we can be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Okay, this is Isaiah 53. We're not in the New Testament. I just want to keep reminding you of that. All right, so also, this is quick. All right, we're, 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 we're coming to an end now. Um, the coming Messiah was also to preach the forgiveness of sins. So if you look at Isaiah 52, 6, now Paul quotes this passage in Romans 10 um, to kind of get at the idea of our role as preachers or ministers of the word. And that's true because we are Christ followers. But initially what Isaiah 52, 6 is about is it's telling us who's going to be doing the preaching. This is fascinating. It says, my people shall know my name. Therefore, in that day, I am the one who is speaking. Here I am. In that day, who's going to, pre to preach forgiveness? I am is going to preach forgiveness. And he's going to say, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who bring good news. Y'all might recall this from Romans 10. Who announces peace and brings good news of happiness and who announces salvation and says to Zion, your God reigns. So it's Yahweh coming to us and preaching the good news, namely, that he's going to be reigning. reigning. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is a lovely one as well, um, because there's a, there's a great misconception um, that the Old Testament, I, I survey people a lot. I just like to know what they think, because I've been studying this for four years, so I forgot how I used to think. So I always will go and I ask other people, and I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember thinking that too. But one, one misconception is that the Old Testament, um, or the Hebrew Bible, I'd rather say, is about laws and punishment and condemnation. Um, but when you get to Jesus, that's when the faith part comes in. That is just false. It's absolutely false. Um, I never would have said that, but I have learned how this is the case. And in some cases, it's actually in plain sight. So... I'm going to start, first of all, with Exodus chapter, in Exodus chapter 17. The Israelites are about to go uh, into battle with a people group. And um, this is kind of a famous story because it's really odd what's going on. But it's fascinating once you uh, realize in the original language what's going on. But it says, um, as they go into battle, it says about Moses that his hands were, were steady. He had 
Both of his hands were up in the air, and they were steady until the sun set. And so Joshua, who was actually also uh, a coming messianic figure that we just don't have time to talk about, um, overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Now, you might say he stared or steadfast, but the Hebrew word here is emunach, emunach. Now, emunach is the term faithful, where we get our term faith from. Faith. So, in other words, when you go deeper into the scriptures, you're going to see the same word emunach, but it's translated as faith. Um, so, it wasn't the effort of, or, or the might of the Israelite, Israelites that conquered the other nation. It was faith alone. Period. Exodus 14, 14, a little bit before that, um, Yahweh is speaking to Moses. He says, do not fear. Stand by and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, you will never see them again forever. The Lord will fight for you while you keep silent. The fight's not ours. Faith alone. Um, 1 Samuel, this is, this is the story of, the famous story of when David's about to fight the, um, the giant. Uh, 1 Samuel 17, 45 and 47. Uh, he goes up, this is, his, this is one of his glory moments, where he's portraying the true Messiah that is to come. And he says, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name or in the identity of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. The Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear. The Lord does not deliver by your tactics and your methods and your efforts, for the battle is the Lord's. I'm not fighting. He's fighting. My job is to trust, period. Um, and what's interesting, I learned this, just some ancient, like, uh, ancient stuff, but um, in the Babylonian Talmud, um, a lot of the Hebrew scholars would try to spend a lot of time like condensing because they're, they're far removed. We have a, just a side note, we have a tendency to look at the Bible as just like this one thing, but you have to remember it was an, it was an evolved document. And so these guys would spend a lot of time in exile just thinking about what happened. Where's God's promise? He said the seed was coming. These people came, they disappointed, they came, they disappointed. And so they had a lot of time to really think and reflect on these things. And so they would, they would sometimes have this exercise where they would try to condense the laws of the Torah into like, what are the things that we really have to do? Because remember, they're not in their hometown anymore. So a lot of the laws they can't carry out. So what is it that we're supposed to do? So they're trying to condense it. And David comes up with like seven, and later on some people come up with like three. And right here in Habakkuk, Habakkuk, I always say those names incorrectly, um, he summarizes it in one, and he says, the righteous will live by faith. That actually doesn't first show up in Hebrews. It first shows up in the Hebrew scriptures. Again, faith has always been the only thing that pleases God. Complete trust uh, from the moment. It's never been about laws. What's interesting is um, we often have another misconception where we think the Hebrews have, you know, it was like too many laws for them to, to take care of, and that's why they couldn't do it. And that's, that's often actually a misconception as well. They actually used to ask for laws. They saw the laws as a blessing because, um, I don't know if you noticed, but the word Torah, um, we always call it the law, but it's probably more, it's probably best represented as instruction. So they were like, teach me teach me, or well, what if I do if this, or well, what if I do if this doesn't happen? I, I need more. I need more. Um, and so, um, you know, this is, this is important to understand that for them, they did understand that, you know, they eventually came to understand that it's, it's trust alone, the person who trusts alone, but it was just a remnant. Um, they often talk about the Bible as a, as a minority report, and the reason why is because it was often this remnant while, you know, who were reflecting on these things, but a lot of people were existing in rebellion. So we often think the Jews, the Jews are messed up, the Jews are messed up, um, but, but remember, there was always a faithful remnant that was thinking about these things. So faith alone. Now, let me tell you something, guys. I'm passionate about this. I love James. I'm so glad the book of James is in the New Testament because effort does matter. But 
what we have to make sure we don't do is put the cart before the horse. It's not effort that enhances our faith. It's faith that enhances our effort. So we have to move forward in trust and allow the spirit of God to win. Okay. And then finally, we'll end here where um, uh, he, this coming Messiah, is going to reinstate Yahweh's eternal reign over us. Because that's what it's always been about. That Yahweh rules over us while we rule over the planet. He said from the beginning, dominion is given to you over the animals, over the land, cultivated. But, but he rules over us with his wisdom. We defer to his wisdom. So we're waiting for him to come back. And in 2 Samuel chapter 7, 12 through 16, this is Yahweh speaking to an old David. And he says, when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. This is why when you're reading the gospel accounts, everybody's running up to Jesus saying, are you the son of David? That's why they're asking him that. Are you the promised one? He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. But we know David's going to die. Um, your throne shall be established forever. So an eternal kingdom of God is right here in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, Daniel chapter 7 is also reflecting on his things. And right after the passage where he's talking about the, the cloud riding son of man, he says, and to him, this is Daniel 7, 14, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. So when he's coming... All right, the, the Hebrews are reflecting on this for years and centuries in exile. So can you imagine when Jesus shows up on the scene and he says, the kingdom is at hand? Can you imagine that? Um, but they do get a little bit baffled because there's this oppression. But anyway, guys, we haven't even touched the New Testament today. And, but this is all of the things that we go to the New Testament and read. According to the Hebrew Bible, Jesus was the human intercessor with divine status that will sacrifice himself on our behalf and preach the forgiveness of sins, and that faith alone will reinstate Yahweh's eternal reign for us. The Hebrew Scriptures teaches us that faith alone is what allows God to reign in our house, in our life. Sorry. Um, I want to give you guys a, a bit of a homework assignment, and then we'll go to a little bit of reflection on something. Um, as you meet at House Church this week, and I hope you do, that might change, side note, that might change for the butlers. Ashley is feeling better, so we have to see. We'll talk about that after. So I just have to say that now because I will forget, guys. I'm sorry. Um, but what I want you to do, because remember in that, that Luke 24, he mentions the being raised from the dead. So what I want you to do is you do some homework and maybe go see how you can find evidence for the resurrection in the Hebrew scriptures. Um, there was a group who didn't see that which is the Sadducees, but there are many other people who did see evidence for the resurrection in the scriptures. Um, so try to find a spot where it's like explicitly mentioned, like this is clear, um, and then try to find a spot, oh, it's a plane, and then try to find a spot where it's implied, where just reading through the story, you can, it's implied that, well, the coming one has to raise again. He has to raise again. I mean, the logic is actually there. I, for me, this is just profound because, like I said, I was like that dull-hearted Jew who just didn't see anything at all. And so I want to leave you guys today um, with, a, with a reflection. Are you reading the word of God or my word of God? 
in John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it's these scriptures that testify about me. So when you go to the Bible, what are you reading into it? What Jesus is saying, and this is what we accept as his followers, is that all of the scriptures are about me. Nothing else. There are things you can derive from it. As Paul says, they're good for instruction and correction and things like that. But you see it through the lens of our Savior, of someone who's coming to save us. In our piety, we often walk around talking about Jesus as the answer. To what? Do you know the problem? So the problem is exhaustively um, laid out in the Hebrew Scriptures, and for this reason, to really get a deeper understanding of what Jesus is actually doing, not just in your life, but for us collectively, I strongly commend you to read the Scriptures. And guys, we didn't address Psalms, Proverbs, and the Song of Songs, but even in those, even in those, it is about Him. So, again, if you're like me and you just, you're reading this stuff and I had concordances and study Bibles and commentaries and you're still not seeing it, again, I want to really strongly commend you to the ministry that these brothers are doing at the Bible Project who, who are helping us to see it as a unified story about the Messiah, about God's chosen one. Um, and that's it, guys. That's all I got for today. If you, if you have any questions, I hope you leave here with questions. I hope you're confused. I hope you're confused. Um, because that's usually what drives that, that curiosity to move forward. Um, if you have any questions, you can come talk to me about it. Um, and I can direct you to some resources. Um, I'm the type of person where I do like to you know, test someone's validity. So I often went to his library and other Hebrew scholars, and I was just like, I've just been dismissing these guys all these years. Like the Jews, they don't know what they're talking about. So us Christians. That's not humble, y'all. Paul says, to them are the oracles of God. So, again, I strongly commend you to do your homework and try to understand the Hebrew Scriptures and get a deeper understanding of your Savior and what he's doing for you what the problem is, what he expects. And my hope, y'all, my biggest hope for anything is that from this, we get a unified understanding of what we're supposed to be doing as the Messiah people.